Test, test. Okay. Test one, two, three. No? You put on mute and we can hear? Can you hear now? Through the mic? Okay. Why is it on mute then? No, but it's it's pushed over to mute. Isn't it? Over that way? Is mute? Yeah. Yeah. Now you can hear me? Yeah. Okay. That's so weird. Huh, okay. Well, apparently that's just for fun. It's not really for... Uh, do we have surgical gloves that I could wear? Something a little tougher than these? Yes, yeah, so we're going to get you... Yeah, we're going to get you moisturized in just a second here. Have a second set, great. Get out of the 3D glasses, sorry. <laughs> Can you uh, give him some Vaseline for his lips? Yes, indeed. Oh, bring your glasses over. There's some glasses at the counter right there. There's some at the counter if there's enough. We are just about ready to go. Uh, no, Romania is north, and Armenia is, yeah, okay. You ready to go? Everybody here? All right. <coughs> Welcome, Welcome to, to another, another live demonstration, demonstration from Dental, DE Labs. We have a really great case this morning, or this afternoon. It's a number 31. It's a C-shaped molar. I'm going to show you the imaging now.
we can see the conventional image on the right here. Um, doesn't show a whole lot. We look at to the left and we can see the CT version of the same tooth. It's much more distinct. One of the things I didn't realize before I had combium CT is one of the biggest artifacts we have in our conventional radiography is the overlaid anatomy. Being able to look at just sliced data instead of capture the whole volume is pretty much everything. Everything's different once you can do that. So let's look at some of the images I pulled off. We've measured the lengths, so I don't have to guess. I've got a great estimated length. Here's the mesial buccal. This may be the mesial buccal, the mesial lingual. Oh no, I'm sorry, this is the mesial lingual. This is a mesial view we're seeing, and this particular canal has, mesial lingual is usually a separate canal with its own apical portal of exit in most C-shaped molars. The mesial buccal typically joins with the, the distal canal, and there's a wide isthmus between them. Uh, we're going to be doing an interesting uh, irrigation routine here. We're going to shape the root canals. We're going to put endovac needles in three, three or four endovac needles in, bond them into place, and then we're going to be irrigating all the canals simultaneously. And what that means is we're going to turn the vacuum on, and Katie is basically going to just add solution as it's pulled down the canals um, and out by the uh, endovac needles. Endovac is 100% safe. You cannot have an irrigation accident if your needles are a vacuum source, not a, an, a, not a hypochlorite source. And why are we doing this instead of, say, gentle wave? Well, only 300 endodontists in the United States have a gentle wave. I assume the rest of you have to have some other way of cleaning your root canals. It's not the only way. They've done some amazing things in, uh, in that technology, but um, it's, it, it, it's the biggest I event in D dissolution of uh, pulp tissue is the time and the freshness of the solution. If there's a constant flow s solution around the tissue, in about 15, we're going to go overboard and maybe do 20 or 30 minutes here because there's so much interproximal tissue, um, that will dissolve tissue at a very rapid rate. We can see here the distal canal has a hook to it. It's about 22 millimeters. We're about 21 millimeters to the mesial buccal cusp on the ML canal. And the buckle is uh, somewhere in between. I think it's closer, what was the mesial buckle as we measured it? Uh, 22. Yes. So we're between 21 and 22 millimeters. Let's look at the cross-sectional data. That's really fascinating. Here's the, I need to reduce it in magnification just a little bit. It gets a little grainy when you look at it, that's really super magnified. And um, remember that CT imaging is similar in, in respect to uh, conventional radiography. And when we were in dental school, I could look at a conventional radiograph and I couldn't see half of what my instructors could see. So it takes a little bit of looking. It looks grainy. It doesn't look tight. It looks like a, an out-of-focus conventional radio, radiograph. But um, as you get into it, you find that um, you can do, in your brain, you can do pattern recognition and see. Here's the most coronal view. This is actually should be enlarged a little bit. This is um, one we're going to cut from the CEJ down. So next we'll go to this. We have a distal canal orifice. We have a mesial lingual. We have a mesial buccal. This is a C-shaped molar root. That's why we call it a C because there's no buccal frication. There's only a lingual frication. And you're going to see something develop here between the mesial buccal and the distal. It's very fascinating. These can be really challenging to get numb. I had to give him an X-tip. I had to give him intraosseous anesthesia. I blocked his mandibular nerve with two full carpules of 1 to 50,000 epinephrine lidocaine and then gave him a, ha a full carpule of articaine on the buckle and that was not relieving his thermal sensitivity <laughs> really at all. Okay, so here we have the next slice down. And we're seeing the two separate orifices here that present coronally combining the mesobuccal and mesolingual are uh, 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 together and the distal canal is spreading and uh, extending out towards the buccal. Uh, 
Obviously, um, I enjoy a little danger because these are really not the simplest tooth you could do a live demonstration on. And we have an awesome patient. Um, and so when you have a really good patient with some interesting anatomy, uh, my impression is I want to go for it. Look at this. Now the mesial part of this root that's now a confluent canal is extending from what we saw over here. The distal is also get extending laterally and there's a little tiny communication right here. Let's continue down. <coughs> also, we're gonna access the tooth while you watch. We're not gonna do the access beforehand, figure everything out and then go, pull it out of the oven and say, I did a great root canal, okay? Because that's not reality, it's not real. It's not uh, pure dental learning. Here's uh, the next view down. Actually, that is pure dental learning. We're almost seeing it all the way around. Look at, here's the mesial isthmus swath. Now one more. And we're getting very close to the terminus of the root canal. And um, it's kind of, uh, as the English would say, a bit of a dog's breakfast down there. Um, we've got possible exit points in multiple areas. Uh, when you go back and we look at the straight on view, the slice through the buccal canals in the mesodistal plane, here's what we're dealing with. So compare this. This is the mesolingual canal having its own portal of exit. That's exiting somewhere around here and the mesial buckle is stretching all the way around. We should see uh, some isthmus filled, hopefully cleaned out and filled here. Again, we, the, one of the more challenging parts in the instrumentation is we have a distal apical hook, about a 90 degree hook. Uh, most likely that's gonna present as an impediment. When I'm taking my rotary negotiating files down there, I'm gonna cut, clean, cut, clean. When I hit that, I, it will stop advancing. I have loose resistance apical file placement, which is the international signal for, yeah, you have an impediment. Then I'm going to pull out files, bend them, sneak around, use an apex locator to locate that uh, distance. And then I'll show you how we can bend the rotary negotiating files, put them around that apical hook, hook the handpiece onto it, and finish the shape in one fell swoop. So um, I hope that's an interesting enough case for you. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking about. <laughs> Obviously, you need some psychotherapy. The primary thing I'm showing with endovac is negative pressure irrigation has exceptional research uh, backing it up, its, its effect. And is that, does it make a difference which direction the fluids are flowing in from safety standpoint? Yes. But the main event, as I mentioned, is it's got to be constant flow. Uh, that's one of the things we get with Genowave. We get a constant flow of solutions during the eight minute cycle that we're hanging onto the handpiece. However, if, uh, if dentists would just irrigate constantly for eight or 10 minutes in all the canals simultaneously, they would have a lot better results with, um, with just simple uh, conventional, even positive pressure irrigation. So the magic happens with hypochlorite. And I'm really grateful to Sonendo for what they've done to uh, in improve our irrigation capabilities. These guys are really smart. They have accomplished some great things, but not everybody can afford an $80,000 console. Okay, how are we doing there? Okay. Let's see if I can get that. Um, it's kind of, it's very convenient to have Take another 
piece of floss longer. Very convenient to have uh, slit dam isolation. Dr. Buchanan, yes. The screen's going to come up, right? Pardon? Is the screen going to come oh. up? No, it's going to all be out of focus, and I hope you just, assume, you just uh, trust me on what we're going to see here. No. Here we go. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. It's a lot to think about. <laughs> so I'll, I'll need your help whenever you think. If I'm out of frame or if I'm out of focus, I really want you to speak up. What is this? Glide? All right. That may be the best that we get it. And we are through the continent. Let's try another piece. Uh, waxed floss seems to work the best. This is glide, which is better than non-wax, et cetera, but he's got a really nice contact. His dentist did a, there we go. Dentist did a great job on the restorative effort here. There we go. All right. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Zoomax uh, microscopes from uh, China. Uh, I'm using, uh, this is a brand new uh, Zoomax scope. This is so cool. It's got the 3D camera inside of it. If you've been watching the demos, you know I'm a big fan of heads up microscopy because it makes my neck and back hurt to sit here and hold exact position in oculars for sometimes hours at a time. We talk about the fact that microscopes improve our posture, but, and that's good, because if you have loops and you're leaning over like this, it's not good, but we don't talk about the fact that my eye watch won't let me sit in the same spot for more than 20 minutes without saying, you need to get up and move around. We look back at the pre-op film. The pulp chamber is a bit distalized to the mesial contact. We're gonna head just behind the mesial buckle Mesial buckle cuss tip because MB canals tend to be directly underneath those. Are we good? We need white balance? Okay. Let's see if I can get that done. Do we have, uh, I need a white piece of paper. Zach, just leave that open, please. We're going to do white balance so that we get a better picture here. This is basically a... Uh, a similar scope in function to the uh, great to the Pro Ergo from Zeiss, and um, there we go. With some additional features, as I said, the 3D camera is really great. Okay, that's better. And these things are like feather light. You don't hear a big clicking sound. Turn to the right for me. Thank you. All right, we're armed and dangerous. Let's go get in that pulse. Oh, by the way, this thing is so hot, I had to give an interosseous uh, bit of anesthesia. Did I explain that before? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's right underneath here. Here's that little hub. So if we lose anesthesia, I'm just gonna pull the rubber dam frame back, drop another half carpal of sitting S forte in there, and we'll be good to go. Interosseous is the silver bullet of endodontic anesthesia for hot lower molars. Okay, remember what we were talking about. The occlusal surface of posterior teeth is not centered over the root structure. It's skewed to the idling cusp side. So if we make an access middle, uh, centered between these cusps, we're automatically too far to the mesial lingual and not far to the mesial buckle. A beautiful crown. It should be totally intact when we get done. You can tell it's zirconium. It's really hard. This is a curved burr made specifically for zirconium crowns. Okay, I'm almost centered there, so I need to, I need to cheat it over this direction a little bit. There, it's difficult to see in the pre-op radiographs if there's metal under here. That may just be a marking from the burr, this metal in the burr on the zirconium. 
We'll find out in just a minute. If there's metal under there, I, it's not zirconium. Yeah, this is zirconium. That's not metal underneath there. I've got an old burr, so I'm going to go up here, throw this burr out, grab my new burr from the new burr row of my Kerr burr kit. Uh, my definition of eternity is waiting for somebody to find a new burr for me when one, the one I'm using is uh, kaput. Turn to the right for me. Thank you. Okay, that's a better angle. Oh my gosh, it's already cutting better. Oh, look at that. Okay, first happy experience of the Inodontist doing a live demonstration is finding tooth structure under the zirconium. We have met that objective. We extend it. Not, I'm right to the mesobuccal cusp. That is classically where I want to be. I'm going to hold it short of the mesolingual. Significantly short. Did you fresh in the water? Do you have some the water? Yes. Awesome. Okay. I am almost to the distal extent. This is one of the few turn. Maybe this is the right. Thank you so much. Because it's a C-shaped molar, we're going to have more of a roundish kind of access than usual. Okay, so I'm going to use a diamond burr to get through ceramics. If there was metal under here, I'd be using a cross-cut, round-ended carbide burr to get through the, the metal structure. Once I hit den, my next burr is a number four round carbide, surgical link. Um, <coughs> just to get into the pulp chamber. You okay? Do you need a little bit of water there? Let's put do that. Great. Okay. Turn this way for me. Now we want to make sure that I'm heading in the angle towards the uh, pulp chamber, so I get the angle of my burr in the embrasure, and then head up to the tooth structure. Can you get behind there? Are you okay, Nathan? Are you feeling that? Let's give you some more anesthetic. And I lost the stop. Can I have another stop? Look at one of these guys. We never use the, these. We don't. Oh, did we take those off on you? Okay. Okay, there's a little trick to doing interosseous. Anesthetic, um, you have a metal cannula and a metal needle. If you put that in there, you'll get some leakage. Just putting an endo stop there will help create a little gasket. We got him profoundly numb about 15, 20 minutes ago. So um, it's not surprising he's lost a little bit of that anesthesia. Again, this is a classic C-shaped molar. They tend to be more inflamed than other teeth, and that is because they have a great blood supply. And they're right next to the mandibular canal, so they will stay vital longer than other pulps that would croak and become necrotic. What that means is they just continue to get more and more inflamed. These can be the toughest cases you'll ever give anesthesia in. Let's see how we're doing here now. Try and save the stop. Here we go. It 
And Nathan, you be sure to let me know if you're having discomfort at all during any part of the procedure. Thank you. Fantastic patient here. Okay, again, at the angle. Is that better? Great. He's fine now. How do you do anesthesia? What were you sharing? Oh, she just asked if the patient has a different experience with the X-tip than with regular anesthesia. Like yeah, they're like numb. They're numb instead of not numb. That's the main difference in the experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a smart aleck remark. Um, answer. The, um, the experience of having it placed is um, I've already got a carpal of articane there, so there's no anesthetic issues with the soft or hard tissue that I'm penetrating. Um, you can't use a, an endo uh, attachment because you've got to get 10, 20,000 RPM to go through that dense cortical plate. You need to look at the radiograph and make sure you have enough inner radicular bone here. This is not the best. Could you hold this? Uh, yeah, we're going to go back to here. Okay, this is not, this is actually pretty good inner radicular bony area. With the X tip, you have, you penetrate and you leave the cannula in there. The previous uh, interosseous technique was with a stabidant and you had to penetrate and then you pulled it out and you had to find that little hole. It was impossible if you're in mucosa. With this, I can put it way down here by the peri apex if I need to. Occasionally you'll have no inner radicular bone and um, in situations where they look, the roots look like this between lower molars, I'll go ahead and put it between the molars in the same root. What do I do with my mirror? Can you put a little suction on that? By the way, this is Katie Dedamonti, my erstwhile assistant. She assists me when she's not going to law school. Here we go. Uh, high speed section. All right. That is the pulp chamber floor. We might have penetrate just a slight bit below that. Let's see what we can find with bent explorer tip. No, that's the pulp chamber. Okay, let's get the LA diamond burr in there and enlarge that access. Okay, here's this is a great example of the use of guidance. I it's really I'm not sure what to expect in there, so if I just use a guided burr with an extended pilot tip like this LA Access Diamond, um, the pulp chamber is going to guide the burr. That's like the template for the access cavity that's extended up towards cavo surface. There's the pulp chamber. We're going to extend to the lingual a little bit and a little bit to the mesial buckle. Don't push my burr. There. Yeah, let's get you a little different angle on this guy. Okay, right. music buckle line angle. Let's extend it. LA Diamond drops into the canal. This is the mesobuccal canal right here. And that's the big old center of the pulp chamber. There it is. That mean, nasty pulp has been giving him a hard time. 
So let's continue on. I'm going to cut around to the distal. There's the mesial lingual extent. There's the distal. Let's put a little burr act in there. Mesial lingual in C shaped molds, as I mentioned, often has its own apical portal of exit. I love my new scope. This thing rocks. There's the mesolingual orifice. What was the comment? We love it too. Good. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. I just got it. I had an old uh, Pro Magnus. We got one of the questions from the audience in the live demo was, um, is that from 1950? <laughs> he said, uh, it, could, it actually could be. There's the distal. Um, I'm going to see if I can get Remember, coronally, we had three separate orifices. It's just below that that we start getting into all the uh, connected root canal spaces. Okay, mesial lingual, mesial buccal. Distal. Can I, am I finished with this line angle? I can drop right into it. This is what LA Diamond Burrs do so well. Drop in the mesial buckle line angle, drop straight in. The distal is a little bit irregular, so let's touch that up. All the time you spend during access pays dividends through the rest of the procedure. You cheat the access, you will pay. It is no bueno. I think we're going to get to do my favorite broaching trick. Uh, you can do almost all your broaching with a single 25 broach if you bend the broach. In dental school they said never bend your needles or your brooches. I found that uh, it, they only work if you do. So remember what they said at graduation, half of what we taught you is not correct and we don't know which half. <laughs> Back up just a little bit. Yeah, that was, that was a particularly unpleasant uh, thing to have shared after you paid tuition and finished your education. All right. That's looking not too bad. It's, we're not doing a ninja access. <laughs> I'm not a fan of ninja accesses. I've done them because I got to show all my colleagues that want to compete on this level that I can do a root canal, especially with guidance. Um, but uh, I, my joke is uh, endodontists doing ninja accesses uh, probably only has a five to eight year half-life in their career. Do we have a bite block in there? Yeah. Okay, so the trick here is why does it matter if we bend this thing? Well, I don't know what size that palatal canal is. I haven't been in there yet. I haven't gauged it. So. Um, I need something small enough that'll go fairly far down, hopefully in the apical third. If I bend this, it will sweep around any size canal perimeter. And basically, this isn't to bind the canal, this is to wind the pulp around the little brooch. It's kind of like fishing, you know? I, I still can't explain why, but there's a tremendous amount of satisfaction of pulling the little guy out there. Uh, one of the things I love about it is showing it to a patient and going, this is how much tissue it took to create that tremendous amount of pain you just had. And they're usually fairly impressed. Or they're just saying that to make me feel good about myself. <laughs> okay, there is some of the pulp. Let's 
So we're going to unwind it. Uh, There's just a little chunk. Okay. I need to bend it a little bit more. Do you have the end of bender pliers or do I have that? Hmm? Pardon? You had that. You have it in your blue tray. This tray here? Okay. Okay. Endo bender plier. First thing I invented for endo. My accountant said, oh, that looks really sturdy. How long would that last? And I said, it could be last your whole career if you don't lose it. And he said, uh, you need to invent something that wears out. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> really missed the concept there. So we were on to files and cutting devices after that. <laughs> but um, I, can't, I can't do endo without an endo bender plier. It's recently been discontinued by Kerr. Um, I've redesigned it, and uh, Dental, DE Labs is going to have that available hopefully by June. Okay, this may be one of those unusual cases where I need a larger brooch. Let's use the 40. First off, would you mind air doing a wash and dry so I can see what may be left in that pulp chamber? <laughs> There's not a lot left in there, is there? Okay. Now this doesn't fit down nearly as easily. It's a lot larger. It's an unshaped distal canal, but maybe it'll engage more of the pulp. Doesn't look like it's gonna. All right, so we're just gonna negotiate through the pulp. It'll be out as soon as we've finished doing a little bit of shaping. <sighs> I would like to use the orifice shaper. This is a Kerr Traverse uh, orifice shaper. It's a 2508, short 17 millimeters. I operate them at like 1,000 RPM. This is just to complete the transition from line angle into the canal. Okay. Let's see if we can negotiate the mesolingual canal. That would that'd cheer me up if we just had that little guy knocked out right away. So we're going to put lubricant in the canal, in the pulp chamber. We're going to bring in J. Morita's Triato ZX2, which has an apex locator inside of it. <laughs> it's, the, it's the coolest, turn this right. It's the coolest ended on a can piece uh, in the world today. And of course, they were the first ones to do a cordless ended on a can piece. We have the ground lead on his lip. By the way, this is a rubber dam that you got to have. It's uh, the rubber dam frame. It's hinged. So I can take radiographs, I can put um, these guys in, I can put a bite block in there. It's really super easy. So for small canals, the first instrument's gonna be a 1306 traverse instrument. This is designed to do rotary negotiation. I'm not putting hand files to length first. I'm putting this to length first. 
Uh, for the last 25 years, we've said to ourselves that rotary filing is great for shaping, but you would never scout a canal with a rotary hand file. There's a rotary uh, file and a hand piece. Um, and, th and there's a perception that we don't have tactile sense with a rotary instrument. In many respects, you'll have better tactile sense. You can't put a bent file around a corner in, in a uh, rotary hand piece, but most canals don't have impediments. Oops, sorry. Okay. I've got this on 300 RPM. I think the Kerr people use it at 500. I like it at 300. Let's, op let's open it up just a little bit. Great. I prefer it at 300 for the reason that um, if, I'm, if I hit an impediment, I've got a big problem. Okay, there's my first cut. Gonna wipe it off. Take a look at the flutes, make sure they're not unwound. One of the things that people who've been doing rotary negotiation with other instruments talk about is the fact that the heat treatment in these makes them tough and they tend not to unwind. Okay. Slows down, we're gonna take it out. It, what, look at where the debris is. This is a two-day class for those of you online. Uh, one of the very first things I told them this morning was the most important skill set that you're going to develop in endo is mental imaging, your ability to build a three-dimensional picture of a space you can't see. How do we figure that out? By indirect evidence. One of the most important pieces of indirect evidence is looking at a file of a certain geometry. We know how deep it was in the canal, and I'm looking in this last four millimeters, there's no debris there. That tells me that's good, that's good because the canal is larger than the tip of this file. Tells me that we may be able to negotiate this all the way to the terminus without meeting an impediment. Okay. The, the debris is getting closer to the flute ends. Okay, it was four millimeters, now it's more like three millimeters. And in the majority canals, this apex locator actually turns itself on and off through the uh, ground lead uh, connection. In the mesolingual here, we're not seeing that. Okay, that's my estimated length. Look at this, as I get closer to length, I have more debris. Now I'm about a millimeter, millimeter and a half from length. She cleans it. We check for derangement of flutes. Any unwinding or winding, we're just going to toss this thing and get a new one. I'm thinking, I'm at my estimated link. I thought I'd get a signal by now. I'm gonna just test this to make sure I have a circuit. That's complete. Okay, good to know. We're not getting a signal there. I don't know why. Let's uh, see if the apex locator will work with a hand file. Here's an away K file. It's measured to my estimated length, which is what, 22 millimeters in the mesolingual? Yeah. Okay. Well, situations where I think there's something wrong with the apex locator is usually um, there's something wrong with me. <laughs> if, if you think it's not working because you can't get the length, you're usually not to length yet. Let's put this directly on the ground lead. Okay, good, we're getting a signal there. I do love ceramic crowns. We don't have any conductive restorations in the way. In fact, we're almost exactly at length. We're maybe an eighth of a millimeter 
long. So let me adjust this. The beauty of this thing when it's working with the rotary files, and I gotta say this is one of the very few times it hasn't worked perfectly um, in, that, in that mode, is that it stops the file exactly at length. Okay, let's measure. What was our estimated length for mesolingual? 21. Oh, we're about three quarters off. 21 and a half plus almost 22. Let's put a 10 in and see what that's like. These little marks in the files, oh, this one doesn't have mark. It's a 40. I need a 10K file, I got the wrong file. There's a file at 21 and a quarter. There's 21 and three quarters. Tip it towards me. There you go. That's long. And the thing I love about it when it's operating with a rotary file is this handpiece can stop a file at, with more accuracy than I can position the file. But that's the secondary reading with a 10K file. I'm going to trust the larger files most. This is at the length we had before, 21 and 3 quarters. Cool. Let's put, uh, let's measure that file at 21 and 3 quarters and see if it stops where we think it would. Would you have an 1806 available for me? Traverse comes in two sizes, 1306 and 1806. It's not working today. Don't know why. Okay, let's wash and take a look. Put this right over here. Suction. some pulp hanging around, I think under a pulp chamber roof there. Let's see if I can peel that out with a bent DG-16. Bent DG-16s are super handy. Wash that again. Yeah, there's the pulp I was trying to pull out of the distal canal. Let's see if I can flick it out of here. There it comes. Let's put that 25 brooch back in. Got more of it. Yeah, let's see if we can unwind it from the brooch. There we go. There's my little puppy. Little, at least the part I think in the coronal. 
axis cavity, we got actually a couple strands wound around the rest of it. So I'll give that to her. Section. I think we've got a little, uh, I'm going to open that up laterally. This is a buck two ultrasonic tip. I'm going to see if I can use this to unroof that lingual extent there. I explained to patients that it took us uh, decades to find another type of dental handpiece that is more irritating than the one we were already using. And we were successful. This is my DG16B bent. There we go. We were able to pull some tissue out of there. I still got the pulp chamber roof remaining there. You don't have to remove all the pulp chamber roof. You have to remove enough of it to get it cleaned out though. Oh, nice. Okay. That's what we're trying to do. Let's carry that a little bit further forward. I was doing gentle wave. It'd be important to eliminate those undercuts because it can influence the fluid flow. Uh, negative pressure irrigation is not necessary. I'm going to put this on slow version of high speed. Charles Moppin would have had an access about 50% this size and he would never cut this pulp chamber roof out, but um, <laughs> I'm not too old Moppin. Very talented endodontic friend of mine from Lubbock, Texas. All right, I'm feeling better about myself now. A little uh, irregular there. Not a bad place to bring an ultrasonic. I want to make sure that my transitional pathways are very smooth because uh, anytime I don't have that, I'm going to struggle. And this is, endodontics is hard enough on some of these unusual anatomy cases. <coughs> let's, uh, let's gauge the mesial lingual canal. I've cut a shape to length with a, a 1306. I'm going to find out what terminal diameter that is and cut a shaping file there and be complete. If this 15K file, is this a 10 here? Is that measured? Yeah, book. Okay. I make sure I'm in the canal, I think I'm in. Not, not always easy in a second molar. Might as well confirm with an apex locator. Please hold this for me. Not to length. Cool. The tip of this thing tweaked. Oh, it is. Look at that. Okay, remember what I said to you earlier. Can we have some suction? We have some saliva here. I dinged the tip of it, bent it back on itself. It came out in one piece because I didn't rotate the file more than 90 degrees in a clockwise direction. Okay, great. Our length is 22 and almost 22, right? 21 and three quarters. Okay. A little bit of a curve will help us get in that orifice. Oh, nice. 
this. Checking length. Yeah. I'm going to call that length. Or I've got a reference on the MB. Let's change that if I can easily to the mesial. No, I'm going to keep it with the mesial buckle. OK. So I've got a 10K file to length. Let's put a 15 and see if it binds. If it binds, I probably don't need any more shape in there than the initial 1306 created. Uh, at least half the time, these traverse uh, rotary negotiation files are the only file I put in a canal to cut dentin. I negotiate the canal, they get to length, I gauge it. If I gauge the canal and it's a 15 is binding at length, I, I'm going to call it a completed shape. Because we no longer think, thank goodness, that our files are cleaning root canals. They aren't. They actually munge them up. Here's the 15. Oh, nice. Why am I happy? Because the smaller the terminus of a canal is, the less work I have to do. <laughs> I'm basically lazy like everybody else. Um, here's a 20 NITI K file. I use NITI K files for gauging. Make sure them in the ML. I think so. Yep. OK. Okay, it's actually going to let a 20 go to length. Let's see what happens with a 30. Sorry. Again, this is where your access, fussing with your access pays off. Oh, nice. Okay. Can I have a 3006? So I've got a 30K file binding at length. That means the terminus of this canal is 0.3 millimeters. So if I put a 3006 in there, I'll have continuity taper. I got this? Yeah. yeah great. OK, thank you. I'm going to bump up the. The, uh, you okay? They just fell out? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. You don't have to work that hard. You're supposed to be the patient. <laughs> if it's facing directly towards me, it's not that easy to see. Just rotate it sideways. Okay. Could I have some lubricant? I have it right here. OK, Nathan, give me the alligator impression you did so well earlier. Just a little bit wider. Perfect. This is a 3006 GTX file. Pull it out. It's stalling. Got debris very near the end. It's, there's a lubricant there, so it does obscure it a little bit. I check the flutes. They're not deranged. Could I have a 3004? I'm getting uh, resistance to placement. And my 30K file wasn't a problem. So I'm assuming that curvature we saw in the mesial view is uh, having an effect on this instrument flexing and going to length. So when you can't, can you section the distal? When you can't get a rotary file to length and you know the tip diameter is not overly large, the next thing you're going to do is drop taper because it will be more flexible. And there we are. Cool. Let's look at the tip. Let's 
sweet. I've got everything except the last millimeter. That makes sense because a 30K file fit there, the tip of this shouldn't be binding there because they're the same tip diameters. Went to length. Now I'm going to put the 3006 in and see if that will go to length. Is that this guy right here? Thank you. Yeah, you can see that there's, there's a little conductive uh, element right next to the latch grip. You don't have to have a little wire on the side of this thing, which was very irritating. Really, it got in the way constantly. All right, here we go. Let's see if the 3006 will go to length now. Oh, that thing is curved. I'm going to let it go. We're good. I've got to taper all the way to length. Let's irrigate with EDTA. Just leave it there one sec. So I'm going to re-gauge this. A 20 should slip through. Just barely. The 30, I'm hoping, binds at length because that means our shape is pretty much completed there. And it goes right to length. Check that length measurement. Here's a 40. Awesome. And the 40 binds, let's change the angle here. So we're looking across the stop. This is one of the advantages of heads up microscopy is I can't look in the oculars if they were there now. And I'm the, I'm the depth of the stop away from it. The stop is a millimeter and a half. I'm a millimeter and a half from my reference point. So that tells me I have a 3006 shape right there. Okay, what's the last act with a K file in a canal? And I'm not going to touch this with a file one more time before I uh, fit a cone. It is to take a patency instrument. Open real wide for me. Oh, let's get a bit of different angle again. If I don't do this, I'm going to have trouble fitting cones because. It's, there's a, always a little tiny bit of debris right at the end of the root canal. It's hard to understand the importance of this, EDTA. <clears throat> but as you narrow the terminal diameter of the canal, or as you get to that narrow terminal diameter, it takes the smallest bit of debris to be a complete canal blockage. That's a little tough to get into. You can see the breadth of the uh, distal canal. Remember, it looked like a single normal orifice, but as we got a little bit down, two, three millimeters, it broadened out. That's what we're seeing to the lingual. Let's put the LA down in here, just touch it. Open for me. Thank you. This is at one quarter RPM. <clears throat> uh, a little bit better. I've still got a little bit of a tag on the side there. I know this is going to come back to haunt me if I don't get it tuned up right. 
Again, it won't bother me until I get ready to do obturation. So this little step right here is going to buckle my cone if I'm not paying attention, if I'm not removing it actually. With a round tip, I can just go back and forth across it and usually remove it quite easily. Okay. All right, mesolingual is done. Let's use a 1306 of the mesial buckle. Our estimated length of the mesial buckle is, was that 21? That was 20 to 22. Okay. So we got a bit of a range there. We're going to put lubricant back in the canal. Using lubricant during negotiation is critical. Hypochlorite is about the worst thing you can use during negotiation. And that's because it will not prevent apical pulp tissue blockage, which is one of the most common problems in the in clinical endo. Okay. Turn to the right for me. Thank you. We are in the mesial buckle. Strangely, using the foot pedal isn't helping. What's the deal? Pain. Pain? Mm -hmm. Okay, we need more anesthetic. <coughs> Do you have another uh, Sinus Forte there? Is that it? Okay. Oh, um, we can turn that temperature behind you up to 70. I, it was too hot here. There, just 70, one back. There you go, perfect. Then you, uh, you're, you'll be able to still feel your feet when we finish. How cool is it to have the entry site there? <coughs> Turn to the right. Thank you. A little bit wider, just for a sec. Great. Not working at its tip yet. Okay. Hold that for me. Let's put a 10 and a 15 file in. Measuring 22. Yeah, close enough. Until we get an apex locator reading. Okay, we're a little bit long, backing up. That's our length right there. Mm, millimeter gauge. Did you see it? Was it right there? Hmm? Oh, it's on my finger. Okay. There we go. So, mesial buckle canal length, almost exactly the same as 21 and a half. Uh, mesial buckle cuss tip.
Okay, here we go. Let's see what the 15 does. Make sure it's in the visa buckle. There we go. Okay, that slips through. Let's put a 20 in place. I need a little bit of powder here. Powder is really helpful when your rubber dam starts getting sticky. Okay, 20K file. Night day files can be bent. You just have to overbend them a bit. Here we are, 20K file in the mesial buckle. That's pretty tight right there. Let's see if the 30 is just as tight. Open for me. Sweet. Okay, so we're about a millimeter back with the 30. Let's put an 1806 traverse in there, measured a millimeter long. If I take a file I'm out the end of the root canal, a millimeter, an 1806 becomes a 2406. All right. I give some people the heebie-jeebies. Is that the wrong file? Okay, thanks. Um, it's just a file. I was joking earlier, it's like uh, apical acupuncture. You're feeling more comfortable now? Great. Thanks for telling me about that, Nathan. Okay, bang, we're there. We have debris all the way to the tip. I'm expecting that our shape there is finished. EDTA. So am I cleaning the canal? Nope. That's going to be Katie doing it with the endovac. What's the last act with the file? I'm going to take a 15K file, pass it to and through the end of the root canal. We'll gauge it one more time. Well, we just about got the second of three canals shaped. That will give us the room to do the, great, we just drop through there, take a 20. Oh, that's a stainless steel file, nice. It's usually easier to get in there. Why do I use NITI K files for the most part to do my gauging? It's because they're more flexible. I can have uh, more accurate gauging results with them. Here's the 30. Okay. It's, let's see how firm it's binding. It's binding at length. Let's see what happens to the 40. So I'm indirectly figuring this canal geometry out. Here's the 40. It's binding the width of the stop. So I actually have a 3006 in there, shape in there. So I'm going to call that done. Let's irrigate and put some lube back in. We're getting ready to go into the distal canal. Before we do that, let's, let's fit cones in these canals. Cone fitting is kind of the proof of the, uh, the shape. Here's how I size these. <laughs> so I've got a 3006 shape in the mesial buckle. This is a gutta gauge. Here's the 30 size. These are all feather tip cones. 
I always joke, don't try this after over-caffeinating yourself. Flip the little guy off. I only need two sides of cones for all these canals I'm going to shape. I need sixes and eights, and I don't need them tip-sized. Uh, can you section there? Grab it at right angles to the cone, grab at the, touch the reference point, pull it out, lock the pliers, pinch the cone so you have a reference. Our length here is 21 and 3 quarters. I'm fit about a quarter millimeter long there. I want to be a half millimeter short. So I put cotton pliers at zero, put my thumb on it. Your first indication that you've hit middle age, which I'm kind of beyond, is when you start using a magnifying glass or mag a magnification to see your millimeter gauge. My birthday is next week, so it's a little bit of a sore topic right now for me. Nice crisp tug back. Okay, if your cone is getting tighter, 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 you don't have the right shape or the right cone. Okay. So nice. I've got my locking pliers. I click that. That's going to go over here. Can I have a Sharpie marker? Thank you. This is going to say MB, the canal, the reference point, MBCT, and the length. That length is 21 and 3 quarters. One half? Okay. 21 and a half. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I'm a big fan of locking pliers. <coughs> uh, let's fit the next cone, the mesial lingual. Uh, I have six pair of locking pliers on all my endo setups. My assistant has two, I have four. I want every one of the cones I fit in a locking plier sitting over there waiting for me. I don't want it rolling over next to the other one and I don't know which one it is. That's infuriating. Okay, so what was the apical diameter in the mesial lingual? 21 and 3, no, April, did, what was the last oh, file I put in? Okay, we have a 3006 shape here. Put this one in the 30 also. This just gets me close. This is not. <laughs> Here's a 3004. You're right, you know what? Uh, in the last uh, half millimeter, I got the 3006 very close. So I'm going to live dangerously here and use a, an 06. We'll see how it fits. And here's where a good access is going to pay dividends. You can do instrumentation through a bad access, but cone fitting and obturation is really ugly if you don't have a decent pathway in there. So I've locked the pliers. I pinched the cone. I'm going to put the little guy on the millimeter gauge, the locking pliers as zero. This is fitting to 22 millimeters. What's my length in this canal? 21 and 3 quarters. 21 and 3 quarters. So I need to be 21 plus. I want it to be a half millimeter short. 
I don't know that that's still my canal length because there's curvature in these canals that's probably shortened a little bit. But I'm cone fit in those two canals now. So that goes over here. I'll take the, yeah, thanks. Would you say 21 and 3 quarters on this one? Yes. Mesial lingual by the mesial buckle cusp tip. Without a reference point, you don't have a length, right? Pick high points. You can't pick low points. Flat planes don't work. Flattening the top of a tooth out doesn't really doesn't help me out that much. Let's check and see how great my little entry is here. Mesolingual, smooth. This is smooth too. It doesn't look quite as smooth as the other one, but it is. Okay, so let's see what's going on in the distal. Can I have an 1806? Handpiece? Do you have it or do I have it? Okay, great. Our estimate in the distal was, oh, is this all ready to go? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 21. Okay. Distal canal is estimated at 21 millimeters. Yeah. Oops. I'm going to be really careful. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, how do you get intimate with a porcupine? Careful. Let's put some lube in there. Um, here's the deal. I'm not going to bang on it if I meet the impediment. I can't know without putting this in whether it'll translate around that curve. It may look more curvy than uh, the file sees it as. When files are rotating, they will bounce around apical impediments that are small. Do you have another uh, lube? Great. Okay, got it. This time it worked. Half the time you got to cut the end off here. Okay. <clears throat> if you're coating your files before you put them in there, you probably have it, could have a better access cavity. Distal canal. Oh, nice. It's translating around the curve. Let's see if the apex locator works touching the file. I gotta tell you, that is really rare. I, I'm not sure I understand why we're not getting this. It says we're slightly long. Wash. It almost looks like two canals there. So the one on the right is probably meeting the MB. Let's try the one on the left and see if we have the same thing going on there. Before we do that, let me uh, get an apex locator reading if I can with a hand file. Also, I kind of want to feel what that's feeling like. So I'm going to take a 15K file, a estimated length. Here's the buckle side of that. Oh, I might have been on the other side. I'm not, it's not opened up yet. Okay, that's length right there by the mesobuckle cusp tip. 
We're going to try the distal side of that. Here we are. I love my microscope. I'm at 21 and a half. Let's see if that's the same length I get on the distal side of that tooth. The lingual side of that distal orifice. Here we are. I'm over there now. Same length. Okay. It's a larger diameter. So let's go ahead and gauge this. She's setting a 20 K file at 21 and a half. Okay, it goes the length. Goes the length over there. I'm probably gonna fit two cones in that canal. Here's a 30. So not an impediment. That's nice. I'm going to take a 3006. This canal here is the buccal side of the distal canal. I did a little balance for us, a little reverse cut there. And I'm cutting in with a 3006. Actually, it's a bit, yeah, I'm going to keep a small, look at this narrowing in the middle of the root right here. So normally I put an 08 in there because I've got maximum fluid diameter limitation of one millimeter. But in this case, I think um, I'm, it would, uh, discretion is the better part of endo. You doing okay there? Great, things are going well. Can I have a 3004? Very bleedy, typical of C-shaped molars. Making slow progress, but making progress nonetheless. Junk coming out, pulp tissue. Here we go, 3004. Most well, sincere compliment a patient pays you. Snoring during the procedure. Here we go. And there we are to length. Right on the other side of that. There we go. I just felt it flex around that terminal point. Let's try the 3006 now. I may be inclined to put carriers in this case. Carry filling is really effective for unusual anatomy. Okay, that's all the further I'm going to push that. Let's irrigate with the ETA. The instrumentation is almost finished. Thirty oh six is short. Both both of them actually they're about a, a, a half short. The 3004 went to length yeah. in both. So would you go for the 04 paper or the 06? Sorry? Which paper are you going to operate? I'm going to fit a comb probably in 06 since the primary canal uh, is mostly an 06 taper. If I go to an 04, I'm going to have less resistance form. I'm fitting short anyway. So if I'm a half millimeter short and there's a little tiny half millimeter of pal parallelism, it's going to be fine.
one more time. Let's see her gate in there. Have you not used sodium hypochlorite yet? I haven't. Nope. So you won't use it until you let it sit in there? I won't use it until I get this sh canal shaped so that it can be effective. Okay. Yeah. Um, sodium hypochlorite is the only thing that will do the job, but you got to have the shape in there to accomplish it. Yeah, we're going to place, uh, let's fit a cone in the distal while we're at it. I like to fit cones before I do irrigation and then put them back in and see if they still fit in the same place. Pardon? Uh, in terms of got a purchase point? Sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've got tissue in that isthmus space, don't I? Nice, crisp. Tug back, excellent. Cork in the bottle, sensation. Our length in this canal is? 21 and a half. Our length in this canal is 21 and a half. My cone is fitting to 21 and a half. I want it to be to, at 21. She's gonna hand me the blade. Okay, we're going to find out if that adjacent canal is confluent. I'd be pretty surprised if it wasn't, but we'll put this back in place. By the way, I love double-ended mirrors. I want the big view when I can get it, and this is when I can't. I just flip it around, and I've got the smaller mouth mirror. These are all Zerk mirrors. They're uh, crystal coated. Let's uh, put another 3006 in there. So they th th throw 30% more light than a rhodium plated mirror. Front surface. Any of the same length. Interesting. All right. Let's take a cone fit film. That'd be in informative.
There's the tune, the distal. Here's the mesial buckle. This one may be confluent and stop short. Turn to the right for me, Nathan. Thank you. Perfect. It's going to full length also. Mesial lingual. You know, those cross-sectional views at the end of the root canal, it got really kind of indistinct and it didn't seem to narrow that much. Mesolingual is fitting shy. Let's take it out and make sure I didn't buckle the darn thing. I did not. So that's fitting about two millimeters short. Let's pull the mesial buckle back, see if it's confluent with the mesial buckle. Pull this guy back, see if this one goes the length. It does. Uh -huh. Interesting. Now you can't really tell until you fit the cone. So I'm going to fit it in the mesial lingual first. Let's take a radiograph. Okay, here's where, there's that rubber dam pays dividends. Hold this, turn to the right a little bit for me, thank you. Okay, John, or Nathan, this is a long ways back there. So take the uh, bite block out for me. We're gonna have you move your tongue to the left. I'm gonna f arm the thing, here we go. Oh, nice. Okay. I'm about three quarters of a millimeter short of the distal. Mesial buckle, mesial lingual, or confluent. Let's take a different angle. You were awesome on that one. Move your tongue to the left. Relax it for me. Okay, you got to teach your assistants that this. X-ray beam isn't ricocheting around the room like a bullet, okay? Four feet straight ahead of it, there's no radiation. And if you put an X-ray sensor, draw a line straight out, you put an X-ray sensor one half millimeter away from it, there's no radiation. Can we rotate that? Let's see how we can. Look at that, I'm closer than three quarters. The distal merges, so does the mesials. <coughs> All right. We are ready to clean the root canals. And I'm gonna answer questions while uh, we're irrigating. Okay, so now we're taking all the, got a perch cones out. Here's the mesial buckle. What's that noise? It's huh? the hand dryer. Oh, the what? The hand dryer. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the distals are confluent right at the very end of the root canal. Um, how do we get a fourth uh, needle in there? No, uh, I mean, uh, endovac needle. 
probably don't need it. Okay. <coughs> okay, do we have a view from up here? This is a tip that's going to go into the suction. So we'll take this out, put that in place, and here's the needle that is going to go to the distal canal. This is an endovac needle. It is, let's look at the end of this. This is kind of interesting. There are 12 little micro needles, right? Isn't that cool? And there should be a stop on here. I think I'd lost the stop. Our disc length was 21 and a half. Okay, let's see. I don't have to get the length, but the closer the better. There we are. Let's see how close we get to that. Now, normally, uh, their technique is to turn to the right for me, Nathan King. Thank you. Uh, Kerr's endovac technique is uh, usually you're going to have this in a little hand piece, hand instrument, and oh, nice, we're right at length. Let's ch check the other ones. Um, I like to do multi candler. If I shorten the irrigation time from 40 minutes to five minutes, but now I've got to hang on to it in every one of the canals. FADD, that's just too boring. I need, I need the movie channel up uh, in the operatory to make that work out. This one should have a stop on it. And so we're all about 21 and change. Maybe a little tricky to get them all in here. We'll find out shortly. There's the mesial lingual. Here's the mesial buckle. We're going to take a radiograph with this in place. So as we would say, this is off-label use, meaning it's just more effective than what they tell you to do. Tongue to the left side. Relax it for me. Nice. Okay. It could be a little further in the distal. Let's see if we can move that down. It may have been uh, pushed aside by the others. Um, I'm going to, these things will stay, I think, right where they're supposed to be. Turn the vacuums on. Sodium have chlorate? Yes. Okay. It's going to be a little tricky to see in there.
you can see in the hoses. Look at the distal, there's some blood product going in there. That's not surprising. We've got it, the solutions moving through this one. Make sure they're all working. We can back it up. Are we getting it through the mesial buckle? Yeah. This guy right here is working? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's just see what happens when we don't add anymore. Is it going to suction it down the pulp chamber? It does. It's, it's empty now. Okay, so we have solutions going to the end of every one of these root canals right now. I've actually got this needle to supply it in the distal, second distal canal. So we are starting at 347. We're going to run this for 20 and 30 minutes. So I'm going to let Katie come over here and do this. Let's answer some questions. Hmm? It's a C-shaped molar. I'm a little paranoid. So maybe, I, I don't know. Let's see how we can go in there and, and blot it and see if a paper point uh, gets wet and it gets bled on in the middle of the canal. That'd tell me there's still pulp tissue left. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you. Okay, what kind of a suction setup do you have to have to make multiple endovac aspirations possible? <coughs> I have two separate uh, suction attachments that, that normally you'd have one of these. One would be to the needle, the other would be to the irrigating syringe, which has a little suctioned uh, tube next to it. So we just took them all over for the, uh, the needles. And so we have one of these in each of the high volumes. Each one of these little blue guys has two suction holes in it. So we just plugged them all in there. Let's see if there's any others. Go ahead. Do I dilute my high sodium hypochlorite? I do not. This is full strength. Okay. But I don't have to worry about what she's doing there. She can be in the distal canal, but it's being evacuated. Greetings from Belgium. Huh? Why fit cones before irrigation? Why fitting cones before irrigation? Because if, the, if I can't fit a cone, I don't want to irrigate, get everything clean, and then mess it up with uh, instrumentation. Instrumentation is going to muck the canal up a little bit. Yeah. I'm, I'm still going to go back there and get Peyton at the end of this, but okay. Uh, what about Endovac Pure? Is it isn't it already for sale? Indovac Pure was an abject failure. It was over design. I begged them to do multi-candler uh, negative pressure irrigation. They want to do something high, high tech and high science and it failed. Uh, they couldn't make them without leaking. Uh, it's not great to have a hypochlorite reservoir in the middle of a bunch of electronics. It's not going to, you got to have some really fussy uh, quality control to make that work. C Chris, could you get me uh, one of those Red Bulls out of my fridge? A little parts. Other questions you guys have? Is that a lot of bleeding what you would have expected from this tube? Is the question was was that bleeding uh, the amount that I would be expecting from this tube? Absolutely. Yeah. Super inflamed. We had to give him three separate interosseous anesthesia rounds to keep it from hurting. So that's a severely inflamed pulp that it's going to bleed. Did I have? a little anxiety when it bled out of the center of the axis cavity. Yeah, I really didn't want to perf in front of everybody <laughs> watching. People in Belgium would see that perf. So yeah, I'm as worried as you are in a, in a root canal. So partially necrotic tooth just would have bled a little bit less than? Partially necrotic pulp always has pulp left at the end of the root canal. 
It dies from coronal to apical where the injury occurs, where the blood supply is the poorest. So, um, and what are the diagnostic uh, changes that you see when it goes from severely inflamed, irreversibly inflamed to partially necrotic? Um, after it's partially necrotic, you'll put cold or ice on it. This is not quite there because when you put ice on it, he could feel it right away. But a partially necrotic pulp is the one you put ice on and they give you a delayed response that's normal to cold. It goes right away. It doesn't increase their pain. If you don't do heat testing, you miss that diagnosis. You don't need to do heat testing on more than 20% of the cases you're going to diagnose, depending on where you practice. Um, we're going to do everything with cold tests first. Usually we have the diagnosis made by that. If we don't have the diagnosis made by that, then we add the heat test and usually we bring it in and, and we know what's going on. How's that going, Katie? Hmm? Visa buckle? Yeah, I'm not getting anything. Okay. I think it's jammed next to the mesial uh, lingual. Hmm? Okay. You know what? Why don't we put a little bit of EDTA down there? That may unclog it. I'll trade places with you. Yeah, I begged Marie Lauro to, to not do endovac pure. Hey, now it's moving through the M MB. We're getting movement in the mesolingual. Mm -hmm. Great. My, the happiest thing is I want it in the distal. That distal canal has the most tissue in it. So. The yellow one is the, in the distal canal. Yeah. Uh, no, just no. pure dumb luck. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're seeing now we're seeing fluids moving in all of them. Remember the smeared layer, it can plug up those little micro holes. Um, in the typical routine used with this, you use a macro needle first and you irrigate to pull out pulp tissue from the middle of the root canal in a larger syringe or cannula so it's not going to get blocked up. Let's change back to hypochlorite. Here we go. Now we're getting movement through the mesial buckle. Uh, the Vista Dental people are making a sodium hypochlorite combined with EDTA, a weak acid solution that is colored. So you're going to be able to see it moving through the needles or through the tubing. Pardon? Dr. Montgomery asks about um, gentle wings because it's a closed system for successive cold tissue removal. So can you explain how endovac compensates for that? Okay, well gentle wave is uh, uh, an effective way to manage uh, C-shaped molar. However, if you have a big swath of tissue, I've had cases that didn't work out. They needed a longer than a five minute cycle. Um, some research I did in uh, printing two block halves so that I could put prosciutto in, in, a, in a, a schematic isthmus between two primary canals um, showed that Genowave did a beautiful job of digesting tissue in adjacent canals, but what, um, or, or from issue, isthmuses between adjacent canals. However, it wasn't quite all gone at five minutes, which is the hypochlorite cycle with that. So if I was doing Genowave here, I'd be using two of their $100 PI procedure instruments. Really what I'd rather have them do is I'd have them, rather have them change the software and allow me to do a longer cycle for more complicated cases. Okay, we're gonna let this suction. Great. If I'm going to do two visit, if I don't want to irrigate this long, one of my alternatives is to place calcium hydroxide in the root canal. 
system. Make sure I give the patient pain medication because it's going to hurt a lot for 72 hours until all the pulp tissue is, is burned to death because it's a pH of 12. This is a pH of 12, but the patient's numb. Put calcium hydroxide in the anesthesia wears off. It hurts a lot. So in my tooth, you're not putting calcium hydroxide in between appointments if I can help it. Are we seeing the MD behave now? <laughs> Question was, should we be worried about AI and uh, machine robotics uh, eliminating the need for dentists doing root canals? Um, actually, I did a root canal on somebody from the Robotics Institute at UCSB uh, University in town. And when I finished her root canal, she looked at me and she said, I think you're safe. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? She goes, oh, we're eliminating everybody's job. I think you're safe. <laughs> like, okay. So I guess... Uh, I'm looking forward to when the government just pays me to be alive and, and then all the robots do everything. <laughs> Have you seen the movie Idiocracy? <laughs> oh my God, that's so funny. Yeah, you have, right? Yeah, basically everybody, uh, there's no people that you can talk to because they're all machines and you ask questions and hopefully they answer your questions, but if they don't, too bad. Let's put EDTA in there. So back in 1975, McComb and Smith proved that just with sodium hypochlorite and EDTA, you can get perfectly clean root canal walls. Look at this, the EDTA moves through there better than the sodium hypochlorite because it's going to unclog any junk in those little needle holes. Let's alternate. Exactly. Yep. It is moving nicely, isn't it? Yeah, and that's actually not in their directions for use. If uh, it's it's a handy way to do it. Good. Okay. Mm, getting a little bit of saliva. Do you want a section on the back side? Oh, there you go. Great. Perfect. Any questions that we have here? Um, the soft pain is increased with inner canal medication. Say it again. Uh, it, can you confirm that post op pain is increased by putting inner canal medication? Uh, yeah, that's actually in the literature. So you have less post op pain after the root canal, after the set first 72 hours, but in the first 72 hours, it's going to hurt more. If you ever have a cut in your hand, you want to find out what it feels like to have pulp, pulp next to uh, calcium hydroxide, just put a little drop of it in there and see how that feels. It's no bueno. It is no bueno. Did that go dry yet? first uh, clinician that turned me on to the beauty of endovac was my friend Filippo Sant'Arcangelo from Barry, Italy. And the other one was Nestor Kowinka, who did some of the basic research on this. And he said, have you ever used endovac? I said, no, it's unbelievably boring. <laughs> and he said, you got to go back and take another look. This, it, it, we're seeing some amazing results.
and he was right. So what's the magic? The magic isn't, there's a discussion about vapor lock. So John Schofield, the guy that invented this concept, talked about uh, the oxygen liberated during tissue hydrolysis creates a, a, an air bubble that blocks out all the tissue. Well, actually, you have a million little tiny uh, uh, gas bubbles in, uh, in a canal that's working on pulp tissue. Um, sometimes in a, upper tooth, in a lower tooth, they're going to migrate out of the tooth because they're lighter than the solution. So the vapor lock part isn't really, I don't think, that big of a deal. I can remove all the oxygen bubbles uh, out of a root canal system simply by doing positive pressure irrigation. So there's nothing magic about negative pressure irrigation. What's magic is it goes to the end of the root canal. It hurts. It hurts. You need some more? Okay. No, I'm sorry we gave you all the anesthetic you get today. Uh -oh. No, that's, that's just not right. I've got another half carpal here. Why does it take so long with each syringe of EDTA? And hypochlorite. Okay. If you look on my website, there's a, there's a video there called uh, Gentle Wave, the C-shaped molar, and, uh, and the, the prosciutto block. We call it the ham sandwich. And basically, nobody's really looked at how long does it take to digest tissue out because they didn't have any way to get it into a uh, into a model. So I have a 3D printer. We divide it, we create a little block with a pulp chamber, two canals off of it, an isthmus between them below that, and uh, then split them in half in CAD space, printed the two halves, and literally uh, you just put a little tiny piece of prosciutto in there and then you glue them together with uh, light cure adhesive and now you've got a tissue and an isthmus. Is it a pulp? No, it's probably a little tougher than a pulp. But we showed for the first time what, how much it takes to get rid of that. And, um, you know, Gentle Wave is amazing. It, in five minutes, it got rid of 90% of the pulp tissue. Is this, where are we going to find that last guy? Okay. Why am I using Sit and S Forte, by the way? Because interosseous anesthesia is directly into their bloodstream. In fact, people who have uh, chronic uh, disease states that require IV drugs being placed, uh, they, there are many uh, cancer specialists who will place a little, uh, looks like an interosseous device like here. They just spin the titanium cap off of, put the IV solutions in there, and then they're good. They don't keep puncturing the patient. It'd be ex exceptional for heroin addicts, but they don't have the tools to get it in there. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I don't know where that came. I, I read too many murder, mi murder mystery novels, okay? Oh, another inter Oh, so to finish the, the comment, the reason I'm using Sitness Forte is it's got one to 200,000 epinephrines. I don't want, I don't want to get his heart going too fast. You can use carbocaine, but it's not going to last very long. You doing better? Super. Nathan, you are an awesome patient. So what do we see? Well, it's just kind of like the pulp you put in a Dappen dish. If you have a constant flow of solution, it's going to go away more rapidly than you might think. If you do passive irrigation, it's going to take about 40 minutes. You're going to irrigate every five minutes. You're going to stir it around. And then in 40 minutes, all the bugs will be dead, as proven by Marcus Hapasalo, one of our most brilliant researchers. I need a little bit more EDTA. I'll, I'll hold that. Go, get us, oh, you have some already? Is that, okay. I'll use the hypochlorite while you're getting that. So what's the most important thing about endovac is constant flow of solutions to the end of the root canal. And most important thing is 100% safety. That's not a small thing. Everybody's worried about using sodium hypochlorite. In fact, there are clinicians who 
won't use sodium hypochlorite, which is like saying, I'm going to do surgery, but I won't use a scalpel. Okay, it's like that's part of your job. If you can't use sodium hypochlorite, you're not good enough to do endo. <laughs> you should do ortho. <laughs> Let the assistants do everything. <laughs> Any questions from the local or online audience? Dr. Montgomery asked your protocol for sodium hypochlorite versus EPA rich Right. So the question is, what's the protocol for uh, sodium hypochlorite versus the EDTA? I'm going to use the hypochlorite, and if I see any slowing of the suction in the uh, adjacent, adjacent tubing, then I'm going to go ahead and add EDTA to see if I can unblock some of those little microtubules micro openings. Okay, let's do that. You can see this one mesial buckle keeps getting blocked up. There's tissue in there. There we go, EDTA has got everything moving again. Yeah, there's something wrong with that needle. Do I have flowable rubber dam to seal this? Yes, I do. Yeah. Because I didn't think to. I didn't think I would. I thought I could get away without using it. Let's put that on right now. It's awesome. I'll show you. This stuff rocks. This is sound seal. You know what else rocks is my uh, plasma arc light curing. Everything rocks here, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to say this rocks, that rocks. Everything's rocking here. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so you guys do a lot of bonding, right? <laughs> okay. In five seconds, this does what 20 to 30 seconds does with a normal light curing wand. Why don't you have one? <laughs> it costs like $3,500. Your time is worth more than this. You'll pay for this in like a week. Can you section on the lingual? Can you fit it over there? Oh, okay. So that's why you don't have one. Yeah. Okay, that's a credible answer. Read up, read up on it. Uh, one of the concerns is, does it cure the polymers too fast? And you get more shrinkage. So um, what I like uh, is, I like dual cure uh, buildup material. So we place it and we wait 40 seconds and then we light cure it. Who 
ask why the patient feel discomfort? Question to ask, why is the patient feeling discomfort? Because we're digesting vital inflamed pulp tissue in his root canal system. Hypochloric accent? Yeah. Knock on wood, I have not. No. Right. Have you? No. Okay, well, don't do that. <laughs> How do you prevent that? Well, I'm using a safe needle. It's a side vent closed in. I'm never going to put in a small canal, lock it in place, and shove on it. I'm going to put it to the binding point and start moving it before I irrigate. This is just in the pulp chamber here. Um, you can't use unsafe needles. If the root tip isn't outside the cortical bone, you won't have a quote-unquote hypochlorite accent. Their face won't swell up. They will go, ow, because they can feel it regardless of how numb they are. But that's, they'll, and they're pro they'll probably have some necrosis of periapical uh, bone tissues. But that's, that's a different situation. Most of these where their face blows up, it's a, quarter, it's a root tip outside the cortical plate and they've, uh, the clinician has put it subperiosteally. And that causes, basically, it makes the tissue die. You have dead tissue, and uh, you have a problem. You have a patient problem and a legal problem, probably. So what does that mean? That doesn't mean you can't use hypochlorite. That means you have to use it with respect. That's not that easy, actually. And calcium hydroxide, if that goes out the end of the root canal, that will hurt for a long time. I've had a case where I did have surplus calcium hydroxide and actually had to get the patient numb, burr a hole through the uh, cortical plate, and literally irrigate it out with saline. Yeah, now bioceramic sealers, whole different thing. You can put a huge amount of surplus, not that we want to, but um, this is hypochlorite? Okay. Can you explain the 3D system you're using? This 3D system, what, what 3D system? Oh, oh, the heads up system? Oh, yes. Uh, basically, I've got a 3D camera in here. I'm not using the oculars. I've got a, a filter, a polarizing filter on my glasses. And that is <coughs> uh, allowing me to see three dimensions up on the screen. So I have an 80 inch screen instead of a little tiny four millimeter diameter of where my irises need to be located to uh, see an oculus. Plus that liberates me from having to put my eyes on it, which limits the position of, of the microscope. Here's something I can do with the microscope with no oculars. I can put it over their torso and do access cavities on upper teeth with no mirror. That's pretty cool. It's my contention that one of the reasons microscopes have not taken off in general dentistry like they did in endo, which basically, um, if you don't have a microscope, you're, you're, not a, a, you're, not, you're actually not up to standard of care in the specialty. But it's because everything we do is through this little tiny hole, so only having a 15 degree potential for position doesn't matter. Even when we do surgery, it's through a little tiny hole in one place. You guys are working on distal of, of lower and upper molars. You have to put them in positions that's very difficult to see into the oculars. Is this, mic, this is on the market now? Indovac is available right now, which so is heavily. This microscope has just, come, just, has just come on the market. It was supposed to be introduced at the, the uh, Chicago Dental Meeting, and nobody's leaving China due to the coronavirus. Hypochlorite? Yeah. <laughs> this, I believe, is about $50,000 with the 3D camera. But it includes the, the uh, screen. And actually, we haven't got it all set up yet, but there's a like a Google Glass component my assistant can wear as the assistant scope. Yeah. Um, the comparable in Zeiss is $150,000. Yeah, I 50 is very reasonable. 
Yeah, a Pico, the Zeiss Pico is $39,000. So um, the, the guys, their version of the Pico, I think, is 29000 10 k less. I'm sorry? Uh, no, we're just about there. It's, uh, I said I'd do it for half an hour. We started at uh, 3.45. We're going to see if we can't obturate these canals. Why are you bored? I need to know if need more. Oh, okay. Got it. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Well, I'm bored. <laughs> I love all of you in this patient in this case, but I'd really like to fill these roof canals. Why don't we do that? Hmm? Do you need an EBT? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you. That looks pretty clean. That looks like a little tissue on the side there. Let's see what that is. Oh, and here's a little factoid that most people don't know. Yeah, it's a pulp stone. Pretty nice, huh? Now, what will really matter is how it did apically. Let me see. It's, a, it's basically a pulp stone that was liberated by the tissue being removed. There we have it. Oh, is that it right there? Oh, I save, I, I collect pulp stones. Awesome, thank you. People collect everything, okay? Once uh, my partner at the time uh, gave me the most enormous, beautiful pulp stone for my birthday. I know, right? Is that a good man, guy? Okay. Let's, uh, let's put some paper points in here and see what it looks like. Yeah. yeah, it's a great idea. Pardon? If the canal is bleeding? Um, with Genwave, it's almost always bleeding afterwards because they, put, they have a vacuum on that thing with a closed system. Closed system vacuums are really good uh, because they're actually pulling, they can pull purulence out of the periradicular tissues. They can pull uh, inflammatory byproducts out. So people tend to have really good post-op symptoms. Uh, we did our first Genwave case of a severely inflamed tooth like this. It was an upper molar. And normally I'd open that up put a piece of sponge in there, leave it open because that will get everybody comfortable 100% of the time. And then you bring them back and you just clean shape and fill the root canals. In this case, it was a live demo. So we opened it up, uh, shaped the canals, did gentle wave, and I talked to her that night, concerned, because I hadn't done a case like this before. And uh, she didn't take the pain meds. So it's the tissue that you leave in there that's the biggest deal, but it's also what's going on in the in the prairie radicular tissues. Was there a question I didn't answer there? No. Okay. Okay, turn to the right for me. Uh, we're about ready to fill the root canals. Uh, but anyway, when you finish with, uh, okay, I'll take a, uh, another 08. We'll put this in the distal. If your wife mentions a little piece of paper in your hair, that's just a paper point that got away from us. Check that out. No bleeding. But if there was bleeding, what would you do? If there's bleeding, I'd, I'd stop it. With the paper points? Uh, well, there's different ways to stop bleeding. We learned this from Gentle Wave. And Gentle Wave, sometimes they'll bleed for five minutes, eight minutes afterwards. The most effective thing, look at that, no blood. The, uh, that makes me really happy. The, um, 
The most effective thing I've used to stop bleeding was uh, suggested by my friend Ryan Facer. Basically, you use 4% hypertonics saline that's in refrigerated. And the chill and the hypertonicity stop the bleeding. They call it an aggregation of of the uh, particles in the blood. Yeah, just sixes. <coughs> Pardon? Uh huh. Is there maybe working against you? Because it's still leaking, but now it's leaking right up to the occlusal surface yeah. instead of way down. Yeah, so that, that actually is the reason I didn't use it yet. <laughs> but let's take that off and see what happens. It, right. It has to be absolutely dry. The best way to get this stuff to stick is to um, scrub with an alcohol cotton pellet. Until you do that, you won't get it to stick. Oh, is that going over the edge of the access cavity? A little bit, I think. Oh. I think you're right. So we're going to fill those with bioceramics. And uh, bioceramics have reduced the need for the same kind of condensation forces we used to place in there. We don't usually down pack as far as we did with sealers that shrunk more. Although I'm hearing some research results that uh, actually some of the bioceramics do shrink. But they can be more likely fill the whole root canal system effectively without gutta percha in every part of the root canal. I'm going to put I'm going to put that in there, um, and I'm going to have gutta percha down through the middle of it. Uh, we're getting a lot of uh, serum fluid. There we go. Just the very tip of it. Great, finally drying. Let me get rid of this and make sure we're not getting some of that wicking up here. Okay. Suction. Okay. So as soon as I get the canal dried, um, I will put sealer in it, drop a cone through there. the tip of it's wet. We're going to place these cones from distal to mesial. Turn to the right. Great, that's dry. 
Not ready for sealer. Okay, look at that. It's dry. Sealer. We got some saliva here. This is BCHF. Yeah. Uh, let's get all the cones in place first. Actually, you know what? I'm, I might cut these off. Okay. Flows really well. Actually, it's a little crowded in there. I think I'm going to go ahead and condense these first. Great. This is the Kerr uh, e EF IC. It's the inductance charging, so you don't have to worry about the little contacts getting corroded. Cones are typically pulled out when uh, heat hasn't been applied long enough. How long are you applying it? Four, four seconds? Uh, it has a four second idiot switch. So it just turns off four seconds. So I'm going to use it some, like two to four seconds. Okay. I'm going to straighten this plugger out. We're going to do a down pack with the intention to backfill with a backfill cone. That's five seconds. After five seconds, I'm going to back it out here. Backfill cones are the same size as those pluggers. That was an 08 plugger. Yes. Can I have a gutter gauge? Okay, sometimes these aren't exactly a half millimeter. All the tips of the, uh, of the uh, continuous wave pluggers are 0.5 at the end. So wherever I down pack, this ship will fit in there. Unfortunately, they don't cut them that accurately. So I size them to be 0.5. I think they'd rather sell you a cartridge, basically to backfill with. I, I really don't like syringe backfilling much. Sealer. Can we get a smaller needle? Oh, this looks great. I just need to be able to find that little opening line. Once I put a sealer in there. Pulled the cone out, didn't I? Let's 
sealer. Let's put on the cone. It gets rid of some of the surplus here. Sure. Butter. Ah, just dry. Use more than this or less than this? Less than this. Oh, yeah, this is a, this is a lot. Okay. Here. Uh, one so far. Trying to clear things out a little bit before we put the next one in. And you put the cones in the new seal too? I have not. Like I said, it's a little crowded in there. Heating and packing. Oh, um, if I can get the condensation below the orifice level, pluggers are really good at cutting this stuff off. Move it sideways. Yeah, it's easier to get gutter perch into canals than out of canals.
down pack the museal the distal lingual okay I'm gonna down pack the distal lingual now that we got all that gutter purge out of there you have the syringe heated up Put it back for Conan. <laughs> Got a gauge. Do I have that? You know what? Let's just use the syringe. You got it? What I don't have is the right needle for this sealer. Got it. <laughs> you guys. Are you talking about the the backfill cone? Yeah. The backfill cone, strategy? yeah, the backfill cone, no, it's the same exact size as the downpack plugger. So wherever that plugger exits, and this is an awkward entry, we've got the, got to perch it just about right in the distal. So sorry, it looked like an ungodly mess there. And we still got some in the mesial here. Um, it's uh, it's it's a 0.5 tip diameter. The the backfill cones are, and I think we're going to do a syringe backfill. The measles. Notice. Let's see. I'm not sure if that's. 
Uh, can I have a uh, paper point for the measles? That may be a uh, sealer either that's dropped down there or is coming back up from the distal canals because we know that uh, they're all attached. Now we have a nice dry canal. Let's put some sealer in there and put the mesolingual cone in place. Yeah. yeah, these needles are just too big. Do we? This guy. Yeah, I get it. Vista has a really nice sealer needle. Um, it wastes less sealer because this stuff isn't inexpensive. But it's got a polymer tip that I find difficult. Um, it tends to lock in the canal and uh, give you massive surplus. Let's put some more in there. Let's put a paper point in the mesa buckle. I'm going to sear this off. I can't see very well in there. Paper point, open real wide. This is the hardest canal to get to. There we go. One more. Okay, I'll take sealer for that one. I'm checking the paper points to see if they're drying the canal. Okay. Yeah. Because I haven't actually placed sealer in these canals yet. They're just a little drip from filling the distals. Remember, these are confluent. Take a radiograph and see. In small canals, open for me. Small canals, uh, we're often going to just do single cone fill because the sealer moves so well. Heater, open. Do we have a bite block in there? Yeah, let's, let's move this back. Open, open, open. A little bit more. That's it, okay.
take a radiograph. Holding a sustained condensation force will move gutta percha more effectively than bouncing on it. Let's take a radiograph and see what we have. Lift your tongue for me. Relax it. Great. Oh, nice. Okay. You can see the uh, the uh, inner osseous next to it. Uh, let's go up here. Right on the button. Got some isthmus fill there. Let's get a different angle. There's the distal, there's the mesial. Hold that sideways. That's in the buccal vestibule. All right. Done. Let's put a temporary in there. Okay. All right, your root canal is finished. And we'll be talking to him tomorrow, find out what his symptoms are. That'll be great. Um, I'll take an alcohol cotton pellet when you get a chance. Do we have template? Okay. What are your typical post op instructions? I read them a little bit in your manual, but. Right. Well, we've had him on uh, Medrol dose pack. So we gave him corticosteroids because his tooth was super inflamed and we needed to wait a day to do the demo. Suction. Next time I see him, we'll go ahead and do some air abrasion and do the post uh buildup. You guys are already bored out of your minds, so I can't just make you do that. Watch that too. And he's had enough also, and so have I. <laughs> okay, so it, it ended up looking nicer than you expected, than I expected. And we're going to get, can I have a uh, sponge, piece of sponge? This is the light cue version. Hmm? It's in the drawer behind you. Okay. Go ahead and that Would that be this? Yeah. Okay.
be really certain that your temporary is not in hyper occlusion because that's going to be super uncomfortable. What temporary? This is tempered light cure. Okay, a round of applause for our awesome patient. We're going to take CT. Um, you can hang out. You can go back. We have uh, refreshments for you in the lab. Indeed. for quite some time. Suction. We're great. I should have thrown carriers in there. Seriously. I know. Close down. Open. I know you got. It doesn't mean something's wrong. Is the patient or somebody in? Uh, are you saying? Close down for me. Okay. We're good. Is 
that's temporary or permanent? That's temporary. We need to put the permit in next time. We went long. What do you do next time? Uh, next time we don't need to get you numb. We just put a rubber dam on it, air braid the inside of it, put the bonded composite material in there, and that's it. Oh, we gotta take that out. Do you have the king stat? That's the little port that we got everything numb with. Let's get a conventional image. <laughs> 